chapter. So Ecclesiastes chapter seven. A good name is better than fine perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is the house of mourning, but the heart of fools in the house of is, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than listen to the song of fools. Like the cracking of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Consider what God has done. Who can strengthen, who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than ten rulers of a city. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever exists is far off and most profound, who can discover it? So I turn my mind to understand, to investigate and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Look, says the teacher, this is what I've discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only I have found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. All right, thank you for reading that, um, Gemma. And um, do keep it open in front of you as we go through. Now, chapter seven that we've just uh, uh, been looking at there, doesn't quite seem to fit within the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes. It is full of practical wisdom. This is where the teacher tells us how we should live this life under the sun, which uh, he means is the life in the here and now. And he's got a long list of, of pieces of advice here. It's like that Baz Luhrmann uh, song, Wear Sunscreen. It's, it's just full of advice. And we're going to see three things in this. The choice, how are you going to live? The clue which is how to live wisely, and the question that unsettles everything about this passage. So firstly, the choice. And hinted throughout the passage is this choice about how we're going to live. And uh, the writer knows that life is filled with this sense of meaninglessness, because life isn't fair, because of chaos and injustice and death. And he wants us to ask the question, well, how then are we supposed to live and there are some options in front of us one option is control so you can try and be defiant in the face of all the difficulties and refuse to accept i am not in control of my destiny and think no i am going to do everything i can to try and dial down the pain of my life so you work hard you get a good job control your environment live safely try and control what you can control and if that's your go-to my suspicion is life under lockdown is pretty hard because life suddenly feels very out of control now maybe into that you want to double up 
lots of strict hand washing regimes and taking every sensible precaution, which you should, um, but it's the control that gives you comfort. Now, one of the things that the teacher says is that learning to be wise means learning about how limited you really are to control anything at all. So in verses 13, 14, we're going to see he's talking about wisdom versus control. And he says, who can straighten what God has made crooked? And verse 14, he points out, you know what? You don't know the future. It doesn't matter how much you try and control it. So he questions whether control is really the great way to go. <clears throat> Another thing we might try is to is to try comfort. So accept that you're not in control of your life, but try and numb the pain of life by maximizing pleasure. And this is your way to escape the sense of futility in life. And clearly lots of us are doing that during lockdown. Netflix has added 16 million subscribers over the last few weeks. Disney Plus has gone from zero to 55 million people watching. And apparently it's the old nostalgic comedy shows that are our favorites. They're like our comfort blanket that we put around us when times are hard. Now the teacher is scathing about trying to escape. I think he even addresses comedy shows on Netflix. In fact, verse six is a really sinister verse. He says, as for the cro crackling thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools, okay? So if you're having a nice barbecue and you hear the crackling of the wood, the teacher is saying it's like kindling. This laughter is like noise. Um, whilst it actually burns you from the inside. Numbing the pain with laughter is nothing more than kindling on which you're burning the path to true meaning. It's, it's a dark verse. So what's the clue? How are we supposed to live? And this is what he argues for. We need to accept that you and I are not in control. And we need to live through the pain by living with the end in mind. And he wants us to think carefully about who we're becoming and what will be said about us after we are gone. So let me uh, uh, just pull up the passage. So you've got it in front of you uh, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Um, if I do this right. Here we go. Good. Right, there we go. Hopefully you can uh, see that now uh, in front of you and we can go through this bit. So his big idea is this. Instead of being scared of death, like um, the person who's seeking to be in control or the person who's just trying to escape, he says, first, you have to overcome your fear of thinking about death. And I think that's really hard. I was chatting to someone recently who said, um, they said to me, I don't do funerals. I just can't. I hate them. Don't do them. Now, I don't think the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying we should be funeral junkies, but the teacher starts this chapter by saying you need to live life aware that death is stalking you and that's bad, but the sooner you come to terms with that, the sooner you can really start to live. So in verse one, he says, a good name is better than fine perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. And it's better to go to a house of mourning than it is to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take this to heart. And he's saying, you know, in a very strange way, the funeral is better than the paternity ward. And you take a double glance at that and think, really? Really? You sure? Teacher in Ecclesiastes, are you sure? You're not just really depressed right now? But then you think to yourself, well, what is a maternity ward filled with? Babies. Yeah, okay. Easy answer. N not just babies, though. It's filled with potential. As you look at a newborn, you want to discover, you think to yourself, what is this child going to do with this gift that is life? But it's only at the end of a person's life you see whether they lived up to that in some way. And I'm sure you've been to a funeral of someone who has lived life well, whose life has touched many people, a life that you, that you were at their funeral and thought that was a life well lived. And what the teacher is saying to us is... Well, one preacher puts it like this, the coffin preaches better sermons to us than the cot. Because at a funeral, you're forced to ask that question that you always ask, who would come out for my funeral? And what would they say? Don't you, don't you ask that kind of question? And I think, what will they say, well, Andy, he loved a crossword. Or, oh, Andy, he never suffered fools gladly. Or, oh, Andy, he knew every line of The Simpsons. He knew every episode. Or, oh, Andy, lived by his own rules. Or, you know, that, what will they say? Or what are they going to say? Do you know what? He loved people well. 
or he knew God or he lived with integrity. What are people going to say? How are people going to evaluate that was a life well lived? And what he's saying is you ought to ask that question. Verse three, I think it means the more you consider death, the more you see life for what it really is. And you find in that a deeper comfort because you seek the answers where you really need to seek them. A sad face is good for the heart. You're looking at life for what it really is. What he's pointing out is that every one of us has this terrible relationship with death. I mean, it's this jarring, painful end point, and it doesn't seem to belong. And ever since Eden, our days have been cut short. That We have this unrealized potential that is that it's the result of the fall of humanity. And so to grapple with your own mortality is to stare long and deep into something real. It's to see the world as God sees it, painful, filled with what might have been. So how does that help us live a wise life? Well, strangely, the, the teacher here doesn't end the chapter just here and say, well, be depressed. There you go. Um, he says, listen, this is the key to living life wisely. Why? Because it saves you from all the other traps that you'll be tempted to fall into otherwise, looking for comfort or looking for control. You start to live life with a realism that knows you're not just to live here for comfort and nor are you able to control life. And actually the question that you really ought to obsess over is who are you becoming? That's what he's saying. At the end of your days, what will people make of you? Who are you becoming? And then he lists off some of the ways this changes things. Let me give you some examples here. So verse five, you're able to take on board uh, criticism. Rather than just looking for escapism, you don't need every relationship to affirm you. Every relationship doesn't need to serve your pride. It's better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than listen to the song of fools. He's pushing us away from our echo chambers, out to spend time with people that we need around us who will challenge us, stretch us, help us reflect on who we're becoming. Then verse 7, it, it, it saves us... Um, uh, for, away from corruption, because as you're aware of who you're becoming, it means you, you, you're painfully aware. You don't want to add to the injustice of others. And what he's really saying is the way to make the world fair isn't just about having the right systems in place. It's about having a changed heart. It's not just about having compassion for others, but awareness of how our own sin has the power to corrupt us. Or here, thirdly, it, it makes us patient. Because we realize we're not made in a moment, but in a lifetime. So we keep living life with the end in sight. We're aware that we are not living for a moment, but for a lifetime. Or verse 9, it, it, it cools our temper. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. And he's pointing out so often we're angry because we need to control something's been disrupted by our children or by someone close to us or they threaten our normal means of escape in some way. But living without control or comfort at the center means we are relieved from this burden. We're able to adapt to the challenges of the day, whatever it is. Fifthly, strangely, living with the end in mind means we're actually able to live in the moment. And we don't say, why were the old days better than these? If you live with the end in, in mind, you know it's not really the environment. You know it's not simple as just saying, well, society needs to change most, but us. So you're saved from that. Or sick, it, it changes our approach to money. Comfort and control can very often be bought. And so we love money for the illusion that these things bring us. But living life with the end in mind makes us wise to ask the really important questions. It places money and the role of money in an appropriate context. The seventh, I've um, mentioned uh, these verses already about, about control. Why? Because you, you give up the need to control everything when you live with the end in mind. Because prolonging life stops being the aim. But living the kind of life that means you grow, you flourish spiritually. Eighth, even, even religion is placed in its proper context. Religion for some people is a way to try and control the outcomes of life. Some people are very zealous because they think that their religion means they can control God. 
And the teacher warns you and me about this. It says in verse 16, don't be overly righteous. And you take a double glance at that and think, did I just read that in the Bible? But he's warning against a kind of Phariseeism that seeks to control everything, including God. And then he says in verse 18, the person who fears God will avoid the extremes. The person who fears God avoids the extremes. Why? Because when you have a proper sense of awe for God, you're very aware you can't manipulate him. There's a limit to, um, uh, to religion. In chapter 9 as well, he, he mentions uh, how this changes your view of, of sexual temptation. And, and he talks here about, um, about avoiding the, the, the trap uh, of sexual temptation. I, I find more bitter than death the woman is a snare whose heart is a trap, but the man who pleases God will escape her. Why? Because to live this kind of wise life with the end in mind, it means you're not living from moment to moment thinking, what is going to give me pleasure in this moment right now? Instead, you're always consciously thinking, who am I becoming? Do I like who I'm becoming? Do I want to increasingly become this kind of person? Now, you can probably think of people you know who, as you go through each of these, you think, oh, yeah, they need that kind of advice. You know, sometimes we're better pharmacists than we are patients. We're better at giving out the advice than we are taking it ourselves. But here's the terrible question at the end. Who honestly can live this kind of life? And the teacher admits in this passage, not him. Verse 20, um, there is no one on earth who is righteous. Or verse 23, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. What he's discovering is though he desires this kind of life, this kind of life that you get to the end of it, and you say that was a life well lived. And he's realizing it's impossible to live that kind of life. Verse 29 is his conclusion. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. We look for comfort and control in all sorts of other places in life. Which raises the question for you and I, how do we live a good life under the sun? That means some people will gather together at our funeral and say, you know what? He, she, you lived the right kind of life. And the answer he discovers is we can't, we're trapped. And I think it's important to see at the end of this passage what he's, what he's hoping for actually is Christ. It's only what you see in Christ. Only in Christ do we see this kind of life well lived. It's only Christ who lived his whole life with the end in mind like this. Jesus talked frequently about his death and he wasn't scared of it. He was the only person who through the whole of his life remained completely centered, who knew who he was, knew the values he lived by and was completely unmoved in the face of any temptation. He never lived for comfort. He never sought to control. He never sought to manipulate. He lived his whole life doing the work that God the Father had given him to do. And when we talk as Christians about being rescued, about being brought into relationship with God, we talk about it having something that has to happen for us. It has to be something done by God for us because we can't do it on our own. It needed God to step in and rescue us because without that rescue, we're lost forever. The consequences are serious. So there is, I think, not in this passage, but in the story of the Bible, there is hope. God initiates relationship with us. There is hope that comes in from the outside. It doesn't happen under the sun. It happens from beyond the sun. And the remarkable thing in the New Testament is not only is Christ an example to us of this kind of life, but following his death, resurrection and ascension, Jesus sends the comforter to us. Not only to bring God's comfort, but to bring transformation, to bring change to our lives, to bring a kind of change of priorities that we couldn't get without a miracle breaking into our hearts. So we're told in the New Testament that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. 
And we're told it's God himself making his home within us to change us, to bring about the kind of wisdom that the teacher teaches about, changing our attitude to money, changing our attitude to sex, changing our attitude to people, changing our attitude to power, changing our attitude to pleasure, breaking addictions to having to be in control of everything. Suddenly, in the life of every Christian, there's a new power at work in us that the teacher could only dream about. A power that brings life and a deep spiritual transformation. Because here we are being changed into the likeness of Christ. Because actually God is not done with this fallen earth yet. There is the promise of transformation. So listen, as I finish, I want to give you a piece of application to do this week. For the adults, this is, not the children. And here's the thing, if you dare to do it, I think it's quite a thing to dare to do. Why don't you write out a few things that you dream, hope, that people might say about you after you're gone? What are the things that you hope people might be able to recognize about you? And then honestly think to yourself and pray into, are these the things that honestly would be said about me? And why? And what do I need to pray about? Where do I need to see this kind of radical transformation take root in my life now, today, this week, during this season of lockdown? Listen, I'm going to finish by praying for us, if that's okay. Father God, I want to thank you so much that you are powerful where we are weak, where we look around and echo the words of the teacher in Ecclesiastes and say, who is up for this? Who can do this? Who can live like this? And we turn our eyes to Jesus and we see there is one. There is one who lived like this. And not just an example for us, but one who took on our sin, took on our fallenness, who took on the wrath that that sin deserved and conquered and defeated death for us. That there is hope, not just for this life to see transformation, there is hope in the life to come of seeing eternal glory, peace with you, rest in you, glory with you. And Father, we want to pray, help us today to see this kind of radical transformation in our lives. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and challenge, stretch us in places we've not been stretched before. Father, where we've just been getting uh, flabby and spiritually out of shape. Spirit, we pray, bring us back, bring us back. Enable us, empower us, strengthen us that we might live a spirit-filled life that we might be seeing some of that transformation, even in this life, that you would help us to be a blessing to the people around us. We pray this asking for your power and in the name of Jesus. Amen.